a great number of, of biblical designations. And we saw this morning a, a, a peculiar phrase. Jesus is called in Isaiah 9, 6, the everlasting Father. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and uh, the government should be upon his shoulder. His name should be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. And we saw from the Bible this morning that Jesus said in John 10 and verse 30, I and my Father are one. So if Jesus is one with the Father, it is not improper to refer to him as Everlasting Father. We also saw from 1 John 5, 7, there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. We believe in one God. There's only one God. But that one God has manifested Himself as the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and these three are one, and so it is not improper for the Scripture to refer to Jesus Christ as the everlasting Father. The Father is never called the Son, but the Son is called the Father. Interesting in, in the Scripture. Man is made in the image of God. We saw that this morning, Genesis one twenty six. One God. God said, let us, plural, make man in our image. And God is Father, Word, Holy Ghost, and the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. These three are one, so God made man a spirit and a soul and a body. Jesus Christ is referred to as the everlasting Father. What we're going to do tonight is look at a dozen places in the book of John where something is said to be true of God the Father as, as touching His person and His attributes. And the very same thing, in, in fact, in the very same verse, the same thing is said to be true of Jesus Christ the Son. Now, there's no way that you could examine my life and compare it to God and say, why, well, they're identical. You couldn't compare anybody's life to God and say, look at that, it's a perfect match. The Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, we may come short to different degrees, but, but we all come short. But of Jesus Christ, He could claim absolute equality with God the Father in every particular detail inside and out so that Jesus Christ, look, if He has not sinned, and He hasn't, and He has not come short of the glory of God, and He hasn't, then He exists outside that all of humanity. He is God manifest in the flesh. So let's pray together, and we'll look at these things in the Bible. I can just tell you what it says, but you don't want to just take a man's word for it. You want to look at the Scriptures and, and search the Word instead of the Bible together. That's what we'll do tonight. Father, thank You for giving us the Holy Bible, a light to our path, a lamp to our feet, the truth to which we might anchor our souls. And we pray tonight, Lord, that you'd help us to see truth and believe it and exalt and magnify your Son, Jesus Christ, in our hearts and lives, we pray. Amen. Let's read John 5, and we'll start at verse 17. And read down through verse number 31, because uh, half of these comparisons that we'll make this evening are found in this one passage, all of them in the book of John. The Bible says in John five seventeen, But Jesus answered them, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. How was that understood by the people who heard Him? Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill Him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. That was a tremendous offense to the Jews, because their law, given to them by God, said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The commandments God gave them began with this preface, Thou shalt have no other gods. So when Jesus Christ claimed that God was his Father, and that phrase meant absolute equality with the Creator of the heavens and the earth, the Jews, according to their law, Deuteronomy 14, were, were sanctioned, they were told to put to death anyone who claimed to be God, except in this case, he was God. 
Now, if he wasn't God, they were right to put him to death. But if he was God, they were wrong to not worship him. And so the Bible says in verse number 19, Then answered Jesus and said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, The hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good under the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil under the resurrection of damnation. I can of mine own self do nothing, as I hear I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. All right, look first at the works. In verses 17, 18, and 19, Jesus said, look at particular verse 19, The Son can do nothing of Himself, but what He seeth the Father do. For what things soever He doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Let's consider His first work. The first work of God about which we know anything is that He created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, let me ask you something. What man would dare to say, I did that? And if he did dare to say that, everyone would think he was some sort of, of crackpot. No man would make the claim, I created the heavens and the earth. I was there when it was made. I, I, was, I was the co-author of the light. I was the co-author of the sun, moon, and stars. I was the co-author of the plants and the animals and the birds and the fish. I, with my hands, formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Why, if anybody said that, they'd, they'd round him up. They'd medicate him or lock him away somewhere and say, there's something wrong with this guy. But the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. From the very first work of God, we see it was the work of the Father and the work of the Son, and that the Son can do what the Father does and did what the Father does, and the Father does what the Son does and did do what the Father does, and there is an absolute equality in their works. Now consider their day-to-day -day activities. The Bible says there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Jesus said, which of you convinceth me of sin? Well, you, no human being could say that to any other group of human beings. They could all provide convincing proof that the individual standing before them was a sinner. And yet when Jesus Christ stood before Pilate with the scribes and the Pharisees and all their madness seeking his crucifixion, the hired witnesses that they paid to accuse Jesus couldn't come up with any accusation of sin on his part. And so in the works that they do, from beginning to end, there is a perfect equality in deeds between Jesus Christ and and God the Father, they are one. They are one in deed. Now, look at verse number 26. Verse number 26, the Bible says, For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Now, you and I are living souls today 
Because God gave us life. That's why. Our first father, Adam, God gave him life. He's an inanimate object laying there on the, on the floor of the Garden of Eden. Formed of the, of the dust of the ground by the hands of God. He has no life. God breathed into that man and gave him life. From the man, God took a woman and God made her and gave her life. And brought her to Adam alive. There she is. Praise the Lord. Now, your father and your mother are incapable of producing life. If God does not fill the womb, the womb is barren. If God does not bring to the birth, there is still birth and no life. If that child is born alive and God doesn't bless with life for one year, for 10 years, for 50 years, you might make it to 100, but it's God who gave us life. And so we thank God for our life, and we praise God for our life, and we we try to live our lives for God. But Jesus Christ, nobody gave Him life. No more than the Father was given life, so Jesus Christ the Son was not given life. He has life in Himself. And as the Father, we read read later in the passage, as the Father quickens whom He will, gives life to whom He will. So the Son gives life to whom He will. The Father gives life to whom He will. Now, if, if, you, if you're in an accident, I will pray for you, and I will ask God to spare your life. But I don't have the power to keep you alive for 24 hours. If you are uh, about to succumb to some dread disease or illness, I will come and pray for you. But I do not have the power, nor does any man have the power, to sustain your life. That's a fact. And should you enter the doors of death, I do not have the power, you do not have the power, to interrupt that funeral service and raise you from the dead. Jesus Christ does. In fact, Jesus never attended a funeral that was completed. You read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Whenever Jesus showed up and a funeral was in progress, He put a stop to it. He raised that person from the dead. One time he was delayed in making it to a funeral and Lazarus had been dead four days by the time Jesus got there. He got stuck in Atlanta, couldn't make the the transfer flight or anything. You've ever flown, you've been stuck in Atlanta one time or another. Anyway, Jesus wasn't stuck in Atlanta. He was taking care of some uh, business for his father. But by the time he got to, to there, Lazarus had been dead for four days. And Jesus said, sorry, I'm late, but it's not too late for me. And they rolled a stone away and he called Lazarus out. Now, God has life. He has the power to create life. He has the power to sustain life. He has the power to bring life from death, and He has the power to impart everlasting life, and so does Jesus Christ, and so does nobody else. You notice all these guys that have made a fortune preying upon hurting people who call themselves healers? You notice none of them ever, ever ply their trade at nursing homes or hospitals. And not one of them ever shows up. To, listen, when, when and I'm not trying to insult anybody, I'm just trying to help you think. When Oral Roberts died and all his fellow faith healers went to his funeral, why didn't one of them get up and raise him from the dead? I mean, they've been telling people for years that they have the power to do greater works than Jesus did and he worked small miracles, but we work greater miracles. Send us your money and, and we'll heal you. Well, how come nobody got Oral up? Because only Jesus Christ, only God the Father, have life in themselves. What's said of one is said of the other. Look in your Bible in verse 27. And hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Now, all of us from time to time have a great desire to execute judgment. But God doesn't let us do that. And the reason God doesn't allow us to sit in the place of judgment is because 
we lack all the necessary information to make a proper judgment. Now, I can, I can judge, that is, I can determine, I can make a call on what you did. I cannot make a call on why you did it. I don't know the motive. I don't know the intent of the heart. I don't know the design. I don't know the desire. So, so I cannot be trusted. You cannot be trusted with judgment. But God the Father said to Jesus Christ, I give all judgment into your hands. Now, how could God the Father entrust Jesus Christ with all judgment unless he had all the information? And how could he know the intent of every heart? How could he know the desire of every heart? How could he know the motive behind every deed were he not every bit God? He is God. That's why you can call Jesus the Everlasting Father, because He and His Father are one. They are one in work, they are one in life, they are one in authority, they are one in judgment. Look in your Bible in verse number 30. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Now, I'm going to be absolutely honest with you this evening. There have been times in my life, let's see if anybody else the same way. There have been times in my life when my will has run this way and God the Father's will has run that way. Anybody else here ever read something in the Bible that God said do and inside you said uh, uh-uh? Anybody else ever read, anybody ever read something in the Bible where God said don't and you said I'll ask forgiveness. And you went ahead and did it. Now look, let's suppose, let's suppose we read something in the Bible God told us to do, and we did it because it was commanded, and because we believe God, but we didn't want to do it. But we did it. Anybody besides me ever done something for God reluctantly? All right. There's, There's also some things God says don't do, that a part of me would like to do. And I haven't done them because, well, he's God. And he's right, and I trust him, and I'm going to yield my desire to his commands. But I've still got that desire. I just had to do the right thing with it. Jesus said, sitting up there in heaven, the invisible God sitting on his throne with a cherub and a seraphim and round about his throne praising him. He has a will. He has a desire. There are things that he wants to do. There are things that he doesn't want to do. And Jesus said, my will and his will are a perfect match. You'll never find us at cross purposes with each other. The only time there was ever any question about Jesus performing the Father's will was as he began to take our sins into his body in the Garden of Gethsemane and head for that cross. When he began to enter into our sufferings, see, because you and I, we've got a controversy with God. But Jesus said, my will and the Father's will, they're a perfect match. He must be one with the Father. I'm not, you're not, but He is. Always has been, always will be. Look in your Bible in John 5, verse 36. John 5, 36. But I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. Now again, I would like to so live the Christian life that if you followed me from the time I got up in the morning until the time I went to sleep at night, you could say, that man must be a Christian. Wouldn't that be great? If if my works would testify that I belong to Jesus Christ. But you just might catch me 
in one of those extremely rare moments when one of my actions or reactions wasn't exactly Christ-like. And it might be if I followed you, well, not for a day, that's not fair, but if I followed you for a month, I might catch you doing something that would bear witness not to your being a Christian, but to your being something else. Uh, years ago, some of you remember this, but, but a lot of you have, weren't here then. This is probably 15 years ago or more. But I'm riding through Orange City, and in front of me was a, a vehicle of somebody that attend, attended our church, and on the back of their truck they had Bible verse bumper stickers. Well, that's a blessing. You see a fellow church member with Scripture on their car, and so we're stopped at the red light, and I beeped the horn so I could wave. And when I beeped the horn, an arm shot out the window and gave me the finger. Well, being the pastor, I followed them. (laughs) Figured, here's a sheep that's going astray. (laughs) So that car pulled in the parking lot, and I pulled in a parking lot, and that individual got out and said, Oh, pastor, I was just waving. Well, you were waving, but you weren't just waving. (laughs) I said, next time, use all five fingers when you're going to wave at somebody. Now, you know what? There's probably been times, when hopefully haven't, not that, but there's probably been a time at work when you didn't do what Christ would have done. You know, the, the what would Jesus do? WJD, that can also stand for what would Judas do. <laughs> you know, you know, just, just depends on your mood, depends on the situation. But you know something? Those men followed Jesus for three and one half years. And not one time did they ever say, I don't know. I don't know. Got my suspicions. Those scribes and Pharisees, they hung on his every word. They watched his every action. They tried and tried and tried and tried to entrap him, to ensnare him. And not one time did he ever fail a test. Satan made her... Listen, if Satan makes a run at me when supper's 40 minutes late, he's liable to get me to say or do something I shouldn't say or do. Jesus went 40 days in the wilderness without, without food, and then Satan made a run at him, and he passed every test with flying colors. You know what he said? The Father's works bear witness that He's holy, and my works bear witness that I am holy, and nobody else's works bear witness to their holiness. Jesus Christ, He and the Father, they are one. There's no... No question about it. It's, it's not even a matter of debate. John 5 verse 23 says that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Now, there have been religious figures who have crossed this earth and who have attained great followings. I I am not aware of any of them asking or demanding or stating that it is proper for you to give me the reverence and the worship and the glory and the adoration that is due the creator of the heavens and the earth. In, In... Many religions and in the charts of comparative religion, you you have this this equality. You have Moses and Hammurabi and Confucius and Buddha and Muhammad and Joseph Smith and and whoever else might be, and and Jesus, and he's there on on this equality. But those men, at the height of their claims, pointed to either no God and we're all equal, or a God to whom I point you. But only Jesus Christ said, Why? If you put me one notch below God, you dishonor Him. 
if you suggest in any way that I am inferior to Almighty God, you dishonor Him and you dishonor me, I am due the very same honor that is owed to God Almighty. Now, nobody else, even the wildest of religious leaders in the grandest of their boasts, ever said that. Jesus Christ said, I am so equal with the Father that if all the host of heaven bowed before the throne to give worship to God, I would be sitting on that throne. Interesting. Men fell at the feet of apostles, and the apostles said, get up. Men fell at the feet of angels, and the angels said, get up. Men fell at the feet of Jesus... And he let him stay right there. Shed tears upon his holy feet. Clean and wash his feet with the hair of their head. Bow before him and worship him. And not one time did he lift them to their feet and say this is inappropriate because it was appropriate. He is due all the honor that is due to the Father. People say, well, I believe in God, but I don't know about Jesus. He said, you believe in God, believe also in me. All right, so that's the John 5 passage. Let's slip over or back quickly just for a moment to John chapter 4. John chapter number 4. Here is a woman, Samaritan woman, at, at uh, Jacob's well. And she needs life, everlasting life. And the Bible says in verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, all right, whose gift is eternal life? It's the gift of God, correct? And who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest ask of him. Who? The one that's talking to you. And he would have given thee living water. Now, look what Jesus said. You need the gift of God. And if you would just ask me, you could have it. Well, and who is he? He's claiming to have the same power to give this woman living water that, that God would have if God was standing there. Do you know why? Because God is standing there. Jesus just said, come on, look at the wording again. Jesus, Jesus is speaking, and said unto her. So she's talking to Jesus, and Jesus is talking to her, correct? If thou knewest the gift of God, it's God's gift. And who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, that's Jesus standing right there, thou wouldest ask of him, and he would have given thee living water. Do you need the gift of God? Yes, sir. Well, why don't you ask him for it? Well, where is he? I'm standing right here. He claims absolute equality to give the gift of life. Now, I could make that claim, but that woman go home dead in trespasses and sins. You could make that claim, but the people you're talking to go home dead in trespasses and sins. But Jesus Christ can give somebody that living water and they'll never thirst again. Never thirst again. Thanks be to God for that. All right, slip over to John chapter 7. John chapter number 7. John 7. Men have doctrines. A doctrine is a teaching. It's things they teach. It's things they believe. We all believe things. And we all teach things to others. Parents teach their children. Mothers teach their daughters. Fathers teach their sons. Sunday school teachers teach their classes. Pastors teach their congregations. And we would all say, everything my father taught me wasn't right. We'd all say, you know, my mom, she had some pretty funny ideas. Great woman, but on this point and that point, you know, sorry, mom, can't follow you there. We'd, we could all remember if we grew up in church, that Sunday school teacher. 
nice lady, nice guy, but just just a little bit. Now, not if you're growing up in this church. In this church, all our Sunday school teachers are wonderful, but, but you still say things like, well, I don't know about, about that. But, and, and then preachers. There's a problem if you come here long enough, you might leave one day and say, I don't know if I agree with the preacher about that. No, really, Bob. Honest. Just stick around. You'll, you'll say it one day. Just hang in there. Because not any of us knows everything God knows. And even the things we know that are right, we don't always communicate them properly. Is that, is that not correct? And so anybody that stood in a pulpit or anybody stood up in their living room and put their hands on their hips and said, you better believe every word I say because I'm always right. The only time you should go along with that is when your wife says it. I'm not saying that she's always right, but it's safe to just go along with it in, 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 that, in that hour. But, but anyway, that's what I do anyhow. My, my wife tells me that. I say, yes, 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 ma'am. Looking up, I say, yes, yeah, yes. Y'all don't believe that. That's good. It just shows you how good, how good, she, good outward testimony she has. <laughs> No, I've got it. In fact, that, that's the best wife I've ever had right there. John 7, verse 16. But look what Jesus said. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Verse 18. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true. And no unrighteousness is in him. Jesus said, I have never, I will never teach one thing that isn't right according to God Almighty. Now, Brother Bain, he pastored for many years. I've pastored for since 1981, if you can believe that. For many years, and and others of you, you've taught the Bible for many, many years. There's not a one of us that's been doing this for any length of time, that hasn't gone back and amended something, that hasn't adjusted something, that hasn't said, you know, what I said, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't wrong, but it wasn't all the way right. Or maybe you said, you know, I had that wrong. I had to, I, I, I'm sorry, go, go back, find that, find that recording and get it out of the archive. And we'll pray that nobody has a copy of it anywhere because that was, I can't, what was I thinking? That was just a mess. Since, since Jesus Christ and His Father created the heavens and the earth, not one time has He ever said, that isn't what I meant. Not one time has He ever said, no, no wait, wait, I'm sorry, that, that, that wasn't quite right. I didn't get that quite right. I, so I've got some more information that's come in, and now that I've got additional information, I mean, how was I to know? That it evolved over 800 million years. I, I didn't know that. Thanks, Charlie Darwin, for pointing that out to me. I, I mean, here I was creating it, and I just, I just, I, not one time has a scientist looked at a microscope and caused Jesus to correct himself. Not one time has a poet written words, and God has said, ah, you're right, throw the Bible away. His doctrine and the Father's doctrine are righteous in every point, on every subject, every time. There's not another man who's ever lived that could say that or would say that. Or if he did say that, could get anybody to believe him that was in the right mind. But Jesus Christ, His doctrine and the Father's doctrine, they are identical. John chapter 10. John 10. If you keep in score at home, this is number 10. We have 13. John chapter 10. 13, what a, what a nice number. John 10, verse 14. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. 
As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Now, how about this? Suppose I ask you tonight, do you know God? You would say, I hope, you would say, well, I do. I've, I've believed the gospel. I've called on Jesus. He saved me, and I know the Lord. Okay, that's good. You, you know the Lord. That's great. I'm glad, I'm glad. Anybody here know the Lord? That's great. Okay, you know the Lord. Now, I'm going to ask you a second question. Do you know everything there is to know about the Lord? We've had a few people in our church from time to time who did, but, but I, don't, I, I don't think there's anybody here tonight that would say, I know everything there is to know about God. You know what Jesus said? The Father knows all there is to know about me, and I know all there is to know about the Father. Now, the only way you could know everything there is to know about the Father is if you are God Himself manifest in a body of flesh. Jesus Christ has claimed now ten times in just one, in just a few chapters in one book of the Bible, He has claimed absolute equality with God the Father. And look at, under all of these different Headings. Look in your Bible in John 10, verse number 28. John 10, verse 28. Uh, start at 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Where are the Lord's sheep? Jesus said, Jesus said, I, they're my sheep, I give unto them eternal life, and they're where? They're in His hand. Correct? That's what He said. They're in His hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Well, now, wait a minute. Where are you? Are you in Jesus' hand, or are you in the Father's hand? Yes. Very good. That's the right answer. Yes. Because His hand is the physical manifestation of the Father's hand. Now, since the Father's invisible and we're here, and Jesus is visible but He's there, how could you be in the hand of the Father and in the hand of Jesus were you not in the hand of the Holy Ghost? And these three are one. But I want you to notice, look, look, there, there's that hand. Well, look at verse 30. I'll just, I won't explain it. He'll just say it. I and my Father are one. Now, what would you do if somebody offered you eternal, everlasting life, safe and secure forever in the hand of God? What would you, what would you do with an offer like that? Verse 31. Then the Jews took up stones to stone him. (laughs) I want to give you everlasting life. Kill him! Now wait. What did we read in John 5? Why are they taking up stones to stone him? Because he just said he's God. And they know that's exactly what he said. And their law, Deuteronomy 13, Deuteronomy 14, says... If a man shows up and claims to be God, kill him. And so they did. And then he walked out of the grave three days and three nights later and said, But I told you I'm God. And the resurrection proves it. All right. Everybody okay? All right. Three people are okay. John chapter 12. John 12. They are one in work. They are one in life. They are one in judgment. They are one in authority. They are one in will. They are one in witness. They are one in honor. They are one in giving the gift of life. They are one in doctrine. They are one in mind, in thought. They are one in hand. John 12, 27. 
Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. What is the cause? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And we know the rest of the verse, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But God the Father said, I'm going to give my Son to die for the sins of the whole world. And it came the hour for Jesus to die, and he said, well, this is why I'm here. The Father had a purpose, and the Son had the very same purpose. They are one in their purpose in living. Can I say, I'm just being honest with you, maybe you'll be honest with me tonight. I want to live for the Lord. Sometimes. Sometimes. And I want my life to be devoted to His purposes. Sometimes. And then there's other times I've got something else I want to do. I'm not bragging about that. It's just so. And He's never asked me to die for anybody. I imagine some of the things He's asked me to do that I've not wanted to do. If He asked me to die for somebody, I'd probably be rather reluctant to do that. What if I had to die for everybody? What if I didn't just have to die for them, but I had to suffer the punishment that they deserved for their sin against God? I'm pretty sure I'd back out of that. Come on, how about you? you, Come on, just suppose tonight, just for a minute, we've got got a man in our congregation with leukemia, we've got a woman in our congregation with cancer, we've got another man in our congregation with cancer, we've got uh, several people here with, with real serious back trouble, physical trouble, that, that sort of thing. Brother Wheeler's walking with his, with his crutches there, and Brother Pat facing uh, surgery and all that. Now suppose God said, all of those things are consequences of sin. Not necessarily theirs, but sin that's in the world, Correct? And he said, tonight, I just want you to pick five people you know and love. And I'm going to take everything that's on them because of sin in the world and put it on you. There's not a one of us that would sign up for that for five people we love. The father said to the son, I want you to go and do that for everybody that's ever lived and ever ever will live. And he said, okay. Okay. If that's your purpose, that's my purpose. And he did it. I'm telling you, there's no controversy about calling Jesus the everlasting Father. They are so one in any particular you choose to focus on that you can't deny their unity and their equality. One more. John chapter 15. John 15. And verse number 9. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. You know, we are so deficient when it comes to love that God has to command parents to love their children. Now, how far gone is the race? When you have to command parents to love their children, how far short of God's glory are we when the Bible says, Husbands, love your wives? Seriously? When the Bible has to, to command children... Grown children to requite, that is to to show kindness and love to your grown parents in their advanced years. Look, if we don't even have it within ourselves to love our children and our spouse and our parents, there's no way we're going to love our neighbor as ourselves. It's just not in us. 
And Jesus came and he looked right into the eye of every person who would ever read his word and said, As the Father loves me, the sinless, holy, perfect Son who never displeased him, so I've loved you. There isn't any way that a man could love us as much as God the Father loves Jesus Christ. But Jesus said, I've loved you as much as the Father loves me. He's got to be God. Nobody else loves like that. Nobody else is capable of that. All right, let's finish up Philippians 2. Philippians chapter number 2. So when Isaiah says the son that is born, the child that is given, should be called the everlasting father. The Bible says in Philippians 2 verse 5, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. If I said I'm equal to God, I would be taking something that doesn't belong to me. If you claim to be equal with God, you would be taking something that doesn't belong to you. When Jesus said, I am equal with God, he wasn't committing robbery. That designation belonged to him. I and my Father are one. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So, we believe in God. We believe in the Son of God, Jesus Christ. We believe in the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, and we don't have three gods. These three are one. Praise the Lord. All right, let's pray together. Father, thank you.